So a friend of mine was interested in or had questions about the different methods you can use for attaching the bolster or pommel on the end of hidden tang or through tang knives. There's a couple of there's a couple of different methods you can use, different ways to do it. And I thought I'd try to do a little clarification on uh, the difference in terms of uh, manufacturing and practicality and all that between having a threaded tang and simply peening the tang over and making a kind of a rivet. So first off, I'll take a look at this one first. We'll start with just a peened tang. This is an early, early example of one of my knives. It's got stacked leather washer handles and my car to bolsters. And you can see the end here. The tang does go all the way through the handle. And this is a micarta bolster, which, if you're not familiar, is a kind of um, phenolic resin uh, type of plastic with a uh, cloth substrate in it. In other words, it doesn't it doesn't behave really like uh, like metal. Uh, so rather than having a counterboard hole, which I'll explain uh, in just a moment, the tang is simply peened over, and all that means. Let's see if it'll focus. All that means is that it's riveted, essentially. So this isn't really counterboard at all. Oh, I can't get a focus here. There you go. And you can kind of see some of the hammer marks, and it's fairly rough looking. Now this is just a utility grade knife. Um, and this is a very strong way to make a handle. Uh, you don't. You don't have. It's very simple. You don't have to. You don't have to have a, a counterbore. Uh, or anything. It, it simply sticks out the end here uh, just a little bit and it works quite well. It, you want to have the handle sections compressed uh, quite nicely first but then as you actually peen the tang over it, it tightens it up. It's like a clamp. It's just, just like a rivet. You know. So that's a very simple method. Um, less aesthetically pleasing for the most part I think most people would consider but it does work and it's very simple to do however in the case of my uh, friend's interest he's um, I'm working with him on a sword project so, <clears throat> so what I will probably I think the best method for this sword is having a flush tang and this is just a another Puko with a stacked birch bark handle but you can see here and forgive the slight discoloration of the brass it's uh, been using the knife a little bit so it's not perfectly bright and shiny anymore but you can see the sh shape of the cross section of the tang there and while this is quite a thin bottom bolster piece or a pommel piece here uh, you still to have that flush fit, you still really have to counter bore. And what that means is the top, meaning the end of the, the bolster section here is flared out and it's bigger at the top than it is at the base. And usually when you think of counter boring, it's usually in like a round configuration, such as um, rivets with a, like a washer or a collar on them. But all that does is allow you to have the flared out top that keeps the, the bolster from popping off along with the epoxy or whatever you're using. Um, so you don't have to have this bulged out end here. So it's cleaner, it's flush, it's flat on the bottom, there's nothing sticking out. And in the case of this sword project, I believe that's going to be, obviously that's going to be the best looking choice. Um, Doing these uh, counter boring, so to speak, in really thin pieces of, of bolster here is not particularly, I don't want to say it's hard, but it, it's just a little more effort than when you have material on, for example, a knife. I'll, I'll show you in a moment. But, and this kind of thing is also a lot more simple than the kind of a decorative pommel we're talking about with the sword because it's flush here. It's, everything's flat. There's no curved surfaces or anything. It's just, it's very simple. But, um, yeah, so another kind of a method that's going to be a little more similar 
or at least a little more comparable to a sword because this is um this is a Mark III trench knife that I've been working on. I've still got a little bit of work to do on it, but you can see that it has the flush the flush tang too, and this is really more of a true bar tang for a hidden tang style knife. The it doesn't taper very much here. It's mostly straight down to about right here. And then I thinned it out a little bit to make slotting that a little bit less um, laborious so I don't have to remove as much brass because I do all these with files by hand. But you can see this is a much thicker piece of brass here. And and that's just the style of knife. It's a, you know, that's just what it's supposed to have, a thicker, a thicker pommel here. But again, it's flat. But in this case, we're thick enough in the, in the brass here to be able to pin the tang as well. So this is counterboard just very slightly, but not nearly as much as if I wouldn't have, as I have to do on those thinner, thinner bolsters. And you can vaguely see it here. There's a little circle right there. And what that is, is a, I was able to take a drill and just drill a hole down that cuts through both of the bolster, the tang, and into the other side, although it's not visible on the other side, it stops just short. But then you take another brass, like a brass rod, stick that in there and solder it in, and it pins the tang in place. That's more of a kind of a classic, traditional, I wanna say maybe American style, or um, sort of early 20th century to mid 20th century way of doing things. This isn't terribly common anymore. But but this is kind of a military style knife, and that's what the Mark, original Mark III trench knives were 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 made that way. Also, the bayonets and everything of that era um, when they started modeling the bayonets off of this particular style of knife. But anyway, this is sort of what your sword tang is going to look like on the end whether we're using iron or brass, which I suspect, I believe, I remember, we're going to be using iron or, or steel, mild steel in this case probably, but you will see the exposed tang on the end, but it, it'll be heavily counterboard, and I will also probably not be pinning it. That doesn't really seem particularly necessary, as the actual bolster will be using, I keep saying bolster, in this case it's a true pommel, it's going to be this big sort of Viking style ornate decorative deal here. So there's a lot of thick material that that, that tang is fitted into. And that leaves more than enough room to really get a nice, really nice good taper in the slot. So we can uh, press the material in and have a, have a sturdy, a sturdy pommel. So regarding... Regarding threading. So when I say threading... The thre threading is the fins on a screw, and an internal threading would be the, the fins on the inside of a nut. So if you think about it, I have a little knife uh, here, unfinished knife with, with the tang that I can kind of use as an example, hopefully. So if we were going to be using threading, the bottom end here of the tang would have threads on it like a screw. And all, all we would all, all I would be doing was using a tap and die set. I would use the die to cut the threads on the end of the tang. And then the the the, the pommel here would be uh, I would use a, a die or a tap set which just cuts the internal fins on what is essentially a nut at that point. The the pommel is acting as a nut and we would just screw it on like a nut. The problem, uh, the problem with this for this particular uh, style of pommel, and there there are possibly a few ways to get around this, but the 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 pommel itself, as we were talking about, has a curved uh, sort of a convex surface that's mating with what is going to be. Say this was the blank. Uh, I'm going to have to profile that on a curve too, which is very possible. It's just a it takes a lot of care, but very much possible. Um, and if I was trying to thread that on there, it's not, you're going to have the, uh, the apex of the two, um, 
the two ends here are going to be messing with the getting in the way essentially of the shape so hopefully that's clear enough and as um, as we discussed it, it would be possible to just have a flat mating surface meaning that the pommel the surface that uh, the pommel is actually touching the wood on because it's going to overhang quite a bit slightly since this is a sword pommel it's, it's a little, little cl more closely similar to this although not exactly to, to have that surface flat and then we could still use the threading the problem with this still is that when you're tightening that down you don't want to get it too tight or too loose and you're gonna to have to line that pommel up in line with say you know the blade you don't want it you know cockeyed in other words and there could be a point where there's it's too loose and at one uh, cockeyed angle but too tight at another you might have to do a whole nother rotation to get that to tighten up and it might get too tight before you end up in another full rotation so it's, there's just more variables and again it's still very much possible to do one that way but under the circumstances riveting is much more simple it's just as robust if I was working with more standardized kind of um, uh, more standardized materials it might be a little more uh, feasible to do it that way. I mean, that's certainly a very common way that I think a lot of reproduction swords are made. But I, I, again, I do everything by hand. I don't really have any machines that I'm using other than a belt grinder. So, as a matter of simplicity, I think the ping tang is going to work uh, a little better. Now, whether or not I send this to my friend for him to assemble or whether I assemble everything myself, uh, we're, still, we're still working that, that out. Um, but hopefully that explains the difference between a peened tang, a riveted tang, versus a threaded tang. That's, that's mostly what I wanted to demonstrate here. So both are viable options, and we'll just have to work out and see which one is best. But... I have a feeling that the peen tang is really going to be to be the way to go with this. So, and I guess I could explain another um, aspect. Um, say this was the blank, and uh, we will be using blood wood, but this is just an example. Say this was your sword tang, and this piece might be a little long, but uh, let's get a different example here. So, the sword tang. Uh, the, the blank, how I'll slot this out, is just drill a pilot hole straight through the middle. And then, since the sword is already made and tempered and everything, uh, we don't have the hot tang. Um, I can't just heat it up in my forge. So what I'm going to do is forge out a dummy or a blank tang to match that uh, the sword tang. And then I'm just going to, while it's glowing red hot, I'll stick the blank in my vise and just push it through while it's red hot. And that works really nicely. It's a very tr traditional way of doing things. And then, of course, uh, we'll have, we'll fit the uh, fit the handle into the um, into the hilt, and of course, fit the bolster on. So that's sort of about the process we're looking at here. A lot of hand fitting, a lot of kind of tedious adjustment work, but that's what you have to do to get a good handle. So hopefully, uh, hopefully that explains things a little bit.